Vision Hub World Fair and Exposition. <laughs> Larry, you've been sitting outside enjoying the sunshine today. A little bit, yeah. yeah. I was, yes. Yes, I was enjoying myself. Well, speaking of places that may be a little colder, although I don't know what the weather patterns are, we are going to beam ourselves in, sort of, to Minneapolis-St. Paul, to 3M's Building 250 in the basement, where right now I am told that it is being robbed. Can we show yes. that on the screen? Can we see if we can get a, <laughs> a picture? And the thieves still seem to be there, <laughs> and for some reason, <laughs> find it entertaining yep. that they're uh, hey, on the security cameras. Hey, if I give you a list of some of the stuff in the shot I need, man, Sean, if you'll just like pack, pocket that and call you me don't later. don't call out their name. Oh, they're not a robber don't. place. I'm not a good wingman. Well, Everybody's named person. Nick. Yeah. Just call them Nick. Hey, hey hi, Nick. Hands away. We're, we're sneaking stuff in the toolbox for you. How about that? <laughs> yeah, even the toolboxes are all taped up, man. You guys got this seriously going on. So, hey, guys, introduce yourself. Say hi. We got Ryan and Sean from 3M, but I know you can't tell them apart. Yeah, the, the, the one of the black mask is the Sean. The one of the black mask. There's Sean. <laughs> guys, introduce yourself. Say hi. Yeah, I'll, Sean, go first. Uh, yeah, Sean Collins, uh, application engineer here at 3M. Hey, thanks a lot for joining us for this. Um, hope you pick up a couple of good things. Uh, really glad to be uh, involved with the Collision Hub program here, so thanks for joining us, Ryan. Yeah, Ryan Marinan, application engineer here at 3M, and uh, much like Sean said, uh, just a great opportunity. I know everybody's sort of uh, webinared out for this entire year, so I'm promising you with this, there are no PowerPoint slides, there's no <laughs> videos to be shown, uh, everything we're going to do is, is right here, and so, uh, you know, definitely looking forward to it, and what we want to talk more specifically about, you know, kind of today, the theme of, is, you know, what are the OEMs saying, you know, and, and really we want to walk you through not only kind of what they're saying, but in this strange year, I mean, we started off the year, we had a handful of groups in here for training, Sean, and, and uh, walking through some of these exercises and how they relate to the OEM repair procedures. And that's really what we want to highlight here today, because at some point, we're going to be allowed to come back together and not wear masks and not have to stand six feet apart and uh, actually be able to work with customers hand in hand again. Yeah, and we're looking forward to that. So, so yeah, this is our, our training center here. So uh, it's way scaled down for what we're doing today, but normally it's packed full of all our, our uh, training tables and everything. And if you look around, you can see there's SOPs hanging up on the sides here. And you can see we've got a lot of props out here. So the, the thing we want to do with our training is we want to make it very um, proactive and very hands-on. So our training, as we say, it's about 80% hands-on. We do some PowerPoint that you have to do, but... Um, for the most part, it's hands-on. So not only do the technicians get to work with the product, um, we also have, like, everything we do, there's a takeaway kind of a little project that they can take back with them. And we'll show you those as we go through this. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's one of the more beneficial things on top of all the great, you know, information and knowledge that they get to come here and experience, bringing these pieces back. And, and a lot of times, you know, we get sort of the leaders in the body shop that they'll come in here for training, you know, for two and a half days. And as Sean mentioned, these panels, some of them we, you know, accelerate age, uh, we put through different cycle chambers, and then we mail them back to you. And that's really where the impactful part comes in. And a lot of shops say, hey, you know, I sent my guy there. I'm, I'm ex oh, clean up an aisle too. <laughs> I'm expecting them to come back and tell the rest of the shop, you know, what, what kind of, sort of experiences do they have having these pieces like we're gonna show you here today. Or, are really where the impact comes in because they, they, they highlight the OEM repair procedure and the processes. Right, and just to reiterate that, it is cool because we do some testing of 1K primers versus 2K primers and bare metal things, and then we put them through the salt spray testing, and again, you get to see the results. So that's really what's important when technicians really think that's cool, when they can see what happens um, with an accelerated aging process, what that's gonna look like in a few months, because they, Oftentimes, never see what it looks like down the road later. I've never seen a problem, Sean. Right, so I know right. I'm doing the right thing. Right. It's kind of like repair mapping and sand scratching. Yeah. Well, we don't have that problem, have but that how problem. many of them see the car again after it leaves, right? Well, and it, it, it's, it's stuff like using the tools and equipment, rivet bonding. That seems to be a, you know, we go through a whole rivet bonding, iCar, you know, iCar simulated exercise where some, a lot of these guys, the first time they're experiencing the squeeze type resistance spot well, or uh, rivets rather, not spot weld, uh, self piercing rivets. Right. Uh, blind rivets and, and how that's different than regular, you know, welding yep. and experiencing the different types of adhesive. Yep. Well, so why don't we get started? I'll, I'll walk you through what uh, what I do in this process here. And Ryan, you chime in with any questions or comments you have. But 
Um, what we do, one of the first things we do, we try to kind of go through what a normal repair process would look like. So we start with um, panel removement and sectioning. So that's where we want to start here. And then we move on and go down to, you know, bonding and welding and foams and then the seam sealers. So we try to go in kind of that order. So we'll try to do that here today. So uh, hopefully uh, Tom can get a close in shot on some of this stuff, but um, this is the prop that we start with. So for those of you who have done the ICAR welding test, this isn't the same exact thing, but it's kind of a, a, a good refresher for guys or kind of a, a little practice prop that they can kind of do the same things. And if you, know, if you, you don't know what I'm talking about, it, it's a rail that looks like this one over here. Thank you, Tom. So this is a, kind of what I'm working on here is a scaled down version of that rail. So it's 16 gauge steel on the bottom, 22 gauge steel on the top. And really why we do this is it gives us an opportunity to talk about the product and the OEM procedures as we go through this. So, for example, this one here, when we build these, first of all, we, we, weld, we spot weld these together. Um, we put either an adhesive or a sealer inside the joint to make it a little more realistic. So, you know, the, when you cut something open nowadays, there's usually something in that flange, whether it's a sealer, an adhesive, a foam product, something in there. So we simulate that, and then we seam seal like a frayable seam sealer over the top, okay? So try to make it, you know, as realistic as we possibly can to do all these exercises. So the first thing we talk about is removing the spot welds and removing the top panel, okay? So first thing we would do is we'd use a file belt sander, and what I like to use is the scotch right belt to remove the seam sealer. So we just take that scotch right belt and go across here and remove that seam sealer. Now, some guys like to use an abrasive or a rollock, but I find that with that, what happens is the aggressive scratches, you can, it kind of erases the outline of that weld. So using the Scotch-Brite really highlights where that weld is. So now you know exactly where those welds are. So real simple to do. So once we do that, now we're gonna cut these, these panels apart using the file belt sander. Now, I know that sounds simple, but um, we see there's a lot of mistakes made out in the industry with that file belt sander. And I can't tell you how many either shops or coaches or whatever have contacted me and said, hey, you really need to do a video about the proper way to use that file belt sander because we see guys going way too deep with it, okay? And that really defeats the purpose. The reason we came up with that was we saw that guys were using drill bits and going too deep or all the way through or had the little hanging chad there where it was ready to fall through. So. So it's important that we do this properly. So what I did is I cut one side correctly and then I cut the other side incorrectly and you'll be able to see the difference. So when I, when I cut this now, you can see that um, where, the, where it was done correctly here, you can still see an outline of where the existing weld was, okay? So that's what you're trying to shoot for here. Um, and really uh, in theory, theoretically in your head, you should be thinking what I'm trying to do is, is I'm not even trying to go all the way through the top panel. I'm trying to make it paper thin, okay? And I know it's, it takes a little practice and timing to do that, but most guys after a few, they do that as long as they're thinking that in their head. So you don't go too far and you'll see that outline and you'll actually feel there's a, a high spot or a nugget left there and that's what we're really shooting for, okay? On the other hand, on this side, you can see I went way too deep. So I can feel a large divot right there and trust me, when we do this in training, we see guys do this all the time until we get them straightened out. So you don't want to go too deep. We've even heard stories of some cars where I know one, one of the OEMs got involved when they saw that and they made the shop replace all the inner panels that they ruined, okay? So we don't want to get in that situation. Now, one thing that's kind of cool is there's an indicator to really know if you're doing it correctly. And you can do a couple of test welds. And this is really what I tell guys to do, is take your file belt sander, and I do a count in my head, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, or whatever it is, and then you try one, hit it with your seam buster, break it apart, see what it looks like. Either you need less time or more time, make your adjustment, make a couple practice welds. Once you get the timing done, then finish them off, okay? Um, you don't wanna go all the way down the flange and then find out you were too deep. So do a couple, break them apart, test them, see what they look like. Now, um, if, you're, if you're going too deep, one of the things you can look for is, you'll notice the, the holes here are like a real square or rectangular hole, and that really is an indication that you went too deep. If you look on the other side, where I did it correctly, you can see there's more of just like a round hole here, okay? So that's telling you most of the panel is still there, 
um, except for right where the weld nugget was. So even by removing the panel or separating it, you can see if you're going too deep or not. So I can't emphasize enough the importance of not going too deep on these panels because you don't want to destroy that inner panel. And Sean, one thing to point out that, that we commonly get the question of is what grit should they be using to remove those welds? With? Yeah, that's a great question too. And you know, it kind of depends on the thickness of the top panel. So if the, if the panel I'm taking off is thicker, um, I'm going to use uh, grade 60 plus. Um, that's what I'm going to use, uh, 60 plus for thicker material. And then thinner stuff, you might go to the 80 then. Okay. Right. 36, I see guys using that. And in my opinion, it's too coarse. And uh, it just doesn't work as well as the as the well, really does. even if you follow what you just talked about as far as getting just down to that nugget you're creating a very deep scratch yeah. in yeah. that lower yeah. panel yeah. that could lead to other problems you know exactly in the repair later on exactly good point so the other thing we want to do is now what we do is we just put a piece of two inch tape on our piece and we section in that area so I put a piece of two inch down and that's my sectioning line just so we can, again, talk about all those issues around sectioning, how we apply our adhesives and, and what kind of spacing we use, all those kind of things. So we'll get to that in a minute. But I just want to show you one kind of tip that's pretty cool for when you're cutting into the panel without destroying the inner again. Because when we make this sectioning cut, this is a cross section here of a rocker panel. Okay, So this cross section here shows you that if I'm trying to cut this area here, I can only go so far with a, with a um, cutoff wheel. And if I get too far, now I'm cutting into the reinforcement behind it. So more and more common, as you guys know, that you, you find a reinforcement behind that outer panel. So how do we get that cut all the way through without damaging that? And the way we do that is we call it a plunge cut using a file belt sander. So if you can see this down here, Tom, um, you, what I do is I use the file belt sander right next to my sectioning line here, okay? So I do it in two different cuts. So this one I cut from this angle, oops, cut from this angle here and just cut through the panel, just grind right through it without going in or deep or anything where we hit a reinforcement, just grind that right along that edge. Then I change my angle and I'll do it this way so you can see it. And then I change my angle and then go this way again grinding right next to my tape edge until that goes all the way through and now i've cut that last little remaining corner there without damaging any of the inner so we call it a plunge cut it takes a little practice um if you do it a few times sometimes you might snag your paper or whatever that's why you go one angle this way one angle this way um you don't want to really push in or you can break the belt or whatever so so uh, a little practice but it works really well and you're not going to damage that inner now the other thing is, what do the OEMs say about the file belt sander? Well, I know some people have, have gone around the country and were saying, oh, you shouldn't use a file belt sander uh, for removing welds. And we contacted the OEMs and got their, their blessing on this. And we, we have information from the OEMs where some of them even like Ford, it's part of their Rotunda tool program or GM, it's part of their program. So a lot of the, a lot of the OEMs actually have it as part of their repair program. So there's no reason you can't use a file belt sander to cut welds. The other thing is the testing we did, we see that it's very low temperature. You would have to get well up over eight, 900 degrees to cause any problems. Uh, the testing we did show you only get to like 120 degrees on that bottom panel. So no problems at all using a file belt sander to cut, okay? So moving on, um, once we have all this off, then we wanna talk about prepping the flange. And honestly, um, I then go from the file belt sander to a roll lock because a roll lock does a little better job on the flange where you don't get any undulations in there from the file belt sander that that uh, roll lock really planes it flat. Okay, so you want to remove these nuggets, plane it flat. And then what we do is we, uh, we do two different attachment methods because Ryan and I were talking earlier and I asked him, Ryan, how many times on a vehicle now, let's say a quarter panel, how many times do you ever use the same attachment method all the way around that quarter panel. Nowadays, so almost, al never. almost never, right? So a lot of times you have a hem flange in one area, a bonded area in another, like on a roof, maybe bonded down the side, um, well bonded uh, in, in other areas. So that's why we do this two different ways. So we've got our adhesive on this side and we prep this 
And a couple things that are important here with the adhesive is, number one, use the correct adhesive, okay? So that's where we start talking about the OEM procedures. So uh, look up those OEM procedures, see which adhesive they recommend. We found through training that most guys are not aware, for example, Toyota, Toyota recommends one adhesive, 3M8115. No other brands, no other adhesives. One exclusive adhesive, 8115. Most guys have no idea and are not aware of that, okay? Um, the other thing <clears throat> that Toyota says that's interesting is sometimes you look in the procedure and it'll talk about weld, or it'll, it'll say uh, MIG weld, MIG or MAG weld. And uh, guys are like, why would, I, why would I MAG weld that when I have a squeeze type welder? Well, if you look in the bulletin, this is crib, uh, where is it here, 181, it said squeeze type welding may be substituted for GMA MIG plug welds. However, squeeze type substitution should match factory weld size, strength, and appearance, okay? So this is, uh, this is a bulletin right from Toyota saying you can substitute MIG, wel or, uh, MIG welds with squeeze type welding. So those are the kind of things we need to be aware of. Also, take for example, um, GM and FCA, Fiat Chrysler. Both of those have a little bit of unique uh, um, recommendation. And for Fiat Chrysler, um, if you're using 3M products, they don't want you to use 8115. And there's only two adhesive companies recommended for FCA. And, uh, um, but if you're using 3M products, they want you to switch from 8115 to 8116. Okay, a lot of guys don't know that. So if you're not using 8116 for the FCAs, you're probably not using the right adhesive, okay? Um, now GM is a little bit different. That used to be the same rule for GM, but they recently, in a few years now, changed that um, to they want you to use all the 7333 structural adhesive for the bonding operations with the GM, except on the door skin, they still want you to use the 8116, okay? So these are the kind of OEM things you have to look up, make sure you're using the correct adhesive, and then you're applying it right. Now, the good news is as far as application goes, most of the OEMs tell you to defer to the adhesive maker's instructions. I know Honda says that specifically in their information. I just saw one the other day that says the same thing. So now you can go to our direction for use and look at how it needs to be applied, okay? So you can see I put the structural adhesive on here and uh, I, it's three coats, right? So one coat down and spread it out. I kind of call it the primer coat. Another coat down, spread it out, making sure we cover all the bare metal. Then one more bead that I call the squeeze out bead. So this ensures that you get good squeeze out and the joint is filled, okay? And then we're gonna get this ready for, for uh, squeeze pipe welding. Now, the details here, devil's in the details, right? The details here are, and, and many of the OEMs spell this out, when you apply your adhesive in a sectioning area, they want you to leave a one inch gap, some of them say 30 millimeters or whatever it is, between your adhesive and your welded gap. As you know, if I try to weld right up next to my adhesive, it's gonna be a mess, it's gonna get porous, it's gonna smoke and burn or whatever. So we don't wanna do that, okay? So leave that one inch gap. And then again, minor detail, but we want weld through primer covering most of that. We don't want any right on that where our weld bead is gonna be here, but we want it all the way up to that as much as possible. And then on the other side, where we're gonna, where we're gonna squeeze type weld, I'm sorry, we're gonna plug weld, okay? So I've got my holes punched in my panel. I've got weld through primer on here. Now, the OEMs are very specific about, in, in almost all cases, about removing the weld through primer um, before we weld in the weld zone. And I know there's many arguments and debates and, and skeptics and everything else about that, but I can tell you that's what the manufacturers want. They do not want us welding over the top of weld through primer. I know it's a bad name, well through primer, but that name came out long before these procedures did. So what, here's a really easy way to do this. And I know some guys use a flat bottom drill or they use a little wire brush or a spot blaster. I think some of those are kind of messy and not that great. Um, I have a really easy solution. So if this was a quarter panel, let's say, and I was getting ready to put this on and I had a bunch of plug welding to do, before I do my test fit, okay, before I test fit, I'm gonna punch my hole in my new part and I'm gonna apply my weld through primer on my flange, all right? Now, when I go on test fit, I can put my panel on and now I can see where my holes are that I need to weld. So I just take a little marker and I mark where those spots are. Now, when I take this back off to apply my adhesive or whatever I'm gonna do, 
Now you just take your file belt with the, with the scotch right belt on it, take the file belt sander. I just use the corner, just make a little circle, just like this. Just go hit each one just real quickly and uh, remove the coating from there, okay? So again, what do the OEMs say? Well, there's two of them I have here that I thought I'd point out. This is from JLR, and JLR says, it's important for the weld quality that the inner area is bare metal. First of all, they say use zinc weld to primer, and then they say zinc and paint residues in the weld area burn and cause serious hole formation during welding. When they say hole formation, I think it's a translation thing, they mean porosity. So welding over weld through primer makes weld porous. Zinc gets into the molten weld puddle, causes all kinds of porosity. They say if the zinc layer and the paint coating are not removed, the zinc paint will burn during welding. The soot produces, or, uh, yeah, produces and prevents satisfactory, wait, the soot produced prevents satisfactory cavity protection. So what they're saying, Ryan's gonna address this, is if I don't clean the paint coatings from the sectioning area or zinc or paint coatings and I weld there, now I'm gonna get soot on the inside and when we cavity wax that, we're gonna cavity wax right over the soot which is gonna later fall off or flake off or whatever. So they want the bare metal clean in the weld area. So that's where, again, another detail that's important is we wanna clean where we're gonna weld from the outside, but I also, went in and cleaned on the inside here. So none of that, those contaminants are pulled up through the weld puddle, okay? So that again is a great place for the file belt sander where I can get in these areas and you can bend this, you can bend this at a pretty extreme angle and get into all these places and clean the paint coatings on the back side as well. So some things that some guys just never really were taught or think about, but again, the devil's in the details and trust me, Cleaning these coatings off, especially for the plug welds, and having nice, clean, bare metal to work on is going to make your life way easier. If you've been trying to weld through weld through primer, it'll change your life welding on clean metal. It's just so much easier to do. Okay? Sean, there's, a, there's another uh, method that I found for myself to be very useful in the fact that I would clean and prep my flanges. I would apply my zinc weld through primer, but I wouldn't punch my holes until I dry fit it because certain OEMs, so specifically, I came from a Lexus certified shop, and, right. and the lower portion of the dog leg, there was a very specific place that you had to put the plug weld. So then I would wait to that point, sure. and, and, then I, and then I would mark both sides, yep. and then I would remove the panel. I would punch my hole, and then I would still use the same file belt method because I think it was, was a J, uh, Jaguar that you mentioned where they actually want it 30 millimeters 30 beyond. Millimeters. Yep. I mean, that's a pretty large area, right. and right. you know what little minor outside of that circle itself you know, we'll cover you know, we'll, yep. cavity wax is where we're going to come in and, and add that additional level of protection. But knowing yep. that, you know, the OEM procedures, sometimes they're very specific in their count and their location. Exactly. So just be aware of that when you're when you're actually going to prep these new panels and don't prematurely go punch a whole bunch of holes in there. Right. And, and all right. of a sudden you find yourself with welds in the wrong yep. spot. And that's a good point. And, you know, it may may take putting that panel on one more time and taking it off. But yeah, because there are situations where some of the OEMs say don't put a weld in the same spot as well. Next so you, to it or so you want to avoid that. But the more, other yeah. thing you can do is you can you can take your old panel and kind of put it on top and mark those two if you, you know. So some situations may allow that. But yeah, that's a good point. And it kind of brings me to what I was going to talk about next, which is some of the are some of the rules as far as welding from the OEMs, right? Where some of them have very specific rules for welding and uh, Honda's one, for example. So Honda here, they, number one, have, they don't want you to weld on automatic settings with these machines. So your machine might have auto weld or whatever they call it, um, but Honda says, hey, we don't want you to do that. And there's a great reason for that, and I've got firsthand experience with that. So um, what they have are what they call weld conditions. So they list all their weld conditions here. And these weld conditions are current, squeeze pressure, and hold time. Okay, so those are the three parameters that make up a weld condition. And you see these are numbered, there's at least 16 of them here. So 16 different setups for welding on this particular vehicle, it's a Honda Accord. So you have to follow these, and uh, um, this is a good example here on a rocker, there's five different conditions for welding on this rocker. And I found that I tried it both ways. One time I was, I was working on a prop, and uh, I tried to weld on um, automatic, and then 
I found out that you could see that it was welding it, but just barely. If you twisted it or pulled it apart hard, it come apart. That's how bad it was, right? So then when I turned the machine to the manual settings, you could notice it was noticeably a longer hold time, a much longer time to hold it and make a longer weld that's much hotter. So be very careful about that. And that's why Honda has those, that information. The other thing Honda has is a bulletin talking about exactly how to do the test welds for Honda. So here it is right here. If you're wondering about it, Honda gives you the, the bulletin. It says set it up like a T like this. Um, I have two welds in here because I was messing around with this, but normally you put one weld in there and you do a twist test and pull this apart. So um, very specific. Nissan, they also have some very specific information. Number one, they're saying uh, if you don't have access to uh, squeeze type weld that you can substitute with mag welding. Okay. Um, they also talk about using a, a rust agent or weld through primer, but cleaning it out of the weld zone. They talk about not welding in the corner, the radius of a corner. They don't want you to do that. You stop before you get to that corner. They have a, a pitch, the distance between the welds is specified. Um, some of the manufacturers might even say something general like add 20% more welds. Um, I can't remember who that is. I think that's actually uh, Mazda maybe, but I, I, don't quote me on that, but somebody says that. Also, there's a sequence for, for Nissan. They don't want you to just go down the line. They want you to jump and skip every other weld and then go back and fill in the welds in between because they're worried about losing some of the current to the previous weld if it's too close. So all these things are really important to follow. Oh, and by the way, they also have their own test method here, a little bit different than Honda. So super specific information. Now, um, I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna talk about weld through primer. So once we get the weld through primer on here, clean it off in those areas, we're ready to weld. But what do the OEMs say about weld through primer? I mentioned the JLR. This is a great position statement. I just came by this the other day and it's, it's from uh, Maserati. Now I know a lot of you probably aren't working on Maserati vehicles, but their rules here, recommendations are very similar to what most of the industry does, okay? Um, but I'll, you also wanna check and make sure there's nothing different or specific for what you're working on. But here they say, eliminate the layer of paint in the area 30 minutes around the bead or spot to be welded. So again, 30 millimeters around that area should be clean metal. Um, for MIG or MAG welding, it is necessary to remove the zinc layer underneath. For spot welding, it is not necessary. So they want the, the zinc move for a, removed for a plug weld, but for a spot weld, um, you can spot weld through the zinc. I think Honda's position is exactly the same. Um, and then for all uh, flanges must be coated with primer. For this purpose, use a specific primer made for welding, so a zinc weld through primer. So that wraps it up really as far as what we would do here. We would finish this off by plug welding one side, um, squeeze type welding the other side, and basically we would end up with a, a piece that looks like this, um, where you can see it's all welded in both, both types of welds, plug welds, squeeze type welds, and we just did a little stitch weld up here to show uh, we do an open butt joint on that, okay? Now, just I'm gonna be very quick with the foam. <coughs> and Thomas, you can follow me over this way. Sorry about that. So the foams, um, what we do for, for training is something that looks like this. Um, and we make a prop that kind of has a little bit of everything in it. So we just put some of our flexible foam in here. We put some of the uh, pillar foam down in here. We label everything. Um, and this, if this is like an intrusion beam, um, some of the manufacturers may recommend using a one-part seam sealer, a one-part urethane seam sealer. Some of them may recommend using like an NVH material um, that we did down here. So this is a, you get less glare here, so this is a bigger example here. And if this was an intrusion beam, you've got, you can see flexible foam here, and then uh, NVH, and then the one-part urethane down there. So. What do the OEMs say about this? There's some so, Sean, one thing to point yeah, out go ahead. is when we talk about using a one-part urethane on those intrusion beams in place, we're not, we don't want, we want to make sure we're avoiding windshield urethane. Steam sealer. We want to make sure we're using steam sealer because the windshield urethane actually is designed to have a slight shrinkage to it, and after it fully cures, you're going to end up with dot, you know, dents down your door that are, you know, are going to look ridiculous, and you're going to end up having to repair a panel that you just replaced. Right. Okay. Good point, and that leads me to this, which is really interesting because um, when I was looking at the Ford procedures, I was a little bit surprised when this came out. Um, but what Ford says to do, it's pretty interesting. This is a roof replacement. 
And for the roof replacement, it says right here, leave as much of the foam as possible intact on the roof bowl. Okay? So you leave that foam on there. So don't just tear that roof off. Use some heat and carefully pull the skin off, leaving as much of the foam behind. And the reason is because then they say at the end when you go to apply, they actually use panel bonding adhesive on the foam to reattach the foam. That's Ford's recommendation. So, um, you know, first of all, we never want to have panel bonding directly between um, an inner panel and an outer skin unless you have that foam in there for that flexibility. Otherwise, you're going to have expansion extraction of those panels, and you're going to see ripples in there. So you would never want to do that like on a door skin or a roof skin. You always want to make sure there's some, some foam in there to have that give. So a lot of guys, what they use is, um, and, and this is called out by many OEMs as well, to leave the foam on and then um, apply some of this NVH material to reattach that foam, okay? So again, they all differ. Um, that's what this is too, by the way. This is, a, this is a foam carrier like they use at the factory. And sometimes you can save these. They're foamed up. You can take the foam off, save them, or even leave the foam on. And again, cover these with the NVH material um, and then snap these back in and uh, before you attach your panel, put the sealer on uh, or the NDH material on and snap the panel back in. Now, one last thing. This is pretty interesting. So um, FCA, Fiat Chrysler, they have a procedure about removing urethane foam. And I know I hear a lot of technicians talk about, hey, man, I almost started a fire on this car because I was welding close to the foam. So they have a procedure, and this is pretty funky, but they talk about removing the seam seal or the, uh, the foam from the cavity, and they actually have a procedure where you can cut a window so you want to follow this exactly what they say, um, but they talk about cutting a window in certain areas and then going in there with a tool and digging all that foam out so you don't start any fires. So they have three uh, procedures. You can cut the window open and do that and weld the window back shut, or you can make a patch and bond a patch back over that window. Or the third option is you can drill a one-inch hole and then put a one-inch plug back in that hole when you're done. Now, that's something you don't see every day. No, I mean, that... I was kind of surprised when I saw that, but it's like, hey, you know, we're, we're not really supposed to cut holes, et cetera, but, man, if the OEM tells you you can do that, you're fine. Their engineers know that's not going to compromise. It's okay to do it for that procedure. It's not okay for a paintless dent repair guy to go drilling holes inside the quarter panels because he's too lazy to learn glue pulling or <laughs> exactly. get, better rod, get better rod equipment. Exactly. So only buy OEM's permission to do that. And then, then Honda calls out the 8463 flexible foam. And then lastly, um, this is Nissan. And Nissan actually has three procedures. It's kind of cool. So filling, uh, filling a cavity before uh, the part is uh, attached or actually two and then filling the cavity after the part is attached and they have some guidance and where the foams go so all good information so that would be our final step applying the foam and then we would send it over to Ryan and Ryan would take it the rest of the way with uh, you know what do we do after everything's welded together and go on to protect that repair so Ryan go ahead and take it away so Sean we were just joking earlier about this and between us having the ability to do this research and all the PowerPoints and everything put together, I am so tired of <laughs> paperwork and research, but really this is what a shop has to go through. And knowing that it, it goes through all the procedures, and I'm not going to dig in deeply into any one of these particular things, but it really is important because the OEMs are, are digging in deeper. They're really digging their, their claws in and they're, they're going through every operation you know, that we're, that we're making and saying, hey, this is how we're going to be doing. Um, so one of the things that I want to do, if you've, if you've checked out a lot of our information on Collision Repair Academy or YouTube, um, caught one of Sean or I's or Tom's, you know, webinars, I'm not going to dwell too much on any of that stuff. I want to do something a little different here today. And I want to go back one step even further. And we talked about this, Sean, when we we're going through this training program is, are we getting too simple, right? How many times have we said, Jesus, that really – but realistically, what we're finding is the, the mistakes are being made in the details. And one of the things I want to address is, is surface preparation. But I, I want to first go back to cleaning the surface prior to applying any primers or any seam sealers and understand one thing, because I've seen this come up a lot lately where guys will they'll hose it onto the material. They may be using a wax and grease remover pump bottle. They'll hose out the panel. They'll, they'll wet down the entire frame rail. And then they're going to go get their rag out 
and then they're going to wipe down the panel, and then they may walk away and just let the rest of it evaporate. The, really, the correct way to be cleaning the surface is going to be wetting out a lint-free dry cloth, right? Now we've got it wetted out. Now we're going to, you know, apply the wet side to the, to the uh, panel. If we don't have a wet spot on a rag that we can flip over, um, grab a second rag, but then we're going to come back in and we're going to dry it off again. Okay, and then we might hit it with some air um, if you have any things like the, when I did when we did the walkthrough before, I got it hooked on a weld and pulled a piece of the cloth off. But really, we want to make sure that we're doing that because what potentially could happen is we could get material that's going to wick down cleaner that could wick down in between that weld zone and it could cause problems for us, you know, later on. Once and we, guys probably are, would be surprised that even a solvent takes a long time to evaporate out when it's trapped between. Especially slow, a lot panels. of wax and grease removers yeah. are, have slow moving solvents yeah. in them, so they're going to be there for quite a while, and so they could actually wick, you know, back and affect the adhesive bond of the seam sealer, um, or even the primers that we're applying, which kind of leads, leads me into my next discussion here. And you guys have heard me over the course of this year talk a lot about 1K, 2K, and and the importance behind that, and I, we, you really can't stress it enough, but it's not just us highlighting and showing this. And, and when technicians come into St. Paul, you know, we let them build these panels, um, and we apply 2K primer to one side, and we let them choose which 1K primer on the other side. We put it through a salt tank. Um, you know, the minimum corrosion test for the industry, and really this is what we're sending back. So if you remember at the beginning, we talked about panels that the technicians are taking home with them. This is one of them where they're going back into the shop and they're saying, guys, what are we doing here? What are we applying product over? Are they giving us the best adhesive bond? Um, are they really preventing against corrosion? And it's not just because, you know, we feel so strongly about it, and it's not because 3M doesn't play in this world. Actually, 3M does. In particular, this is a 3M 1K product. So if anybody wants to pick on us, you know, go ahead. We don't promote that to be used in the collision industry. Um, but really the OEMs, you know, you've heard me reference, you know, Crib 186. Toyota does a great job highlighting here, um, specific on the back, that, that they, you need to use an, a, a two-component, right, not a 1K, a two-component direct metal or epoxy primer. Etch primer cannot exhibit, you know, corrosion prevention characteristics of an E-coat over the long term. I found another one just the other day. I was just skimming through it, and I don't know how I missed it earlier, but 163, um, they talk about poor quality seam sealing, and the fact that panels that come from the factory, right, if you get a replacement panel, that's, it went through a different process than what it did from the factory. So we're going to have to be applying a seam sealer onto those panels, making sure that we're using a quality seam sealer. And then they talk about some of these areas here in this diagram. And I don't know, if Tom, you can kind of capture that a little bit down here. Um, but where these areas they're talking about are in these corners. So we're talking like up here, there we go, right up there and then down here. Okay, they're talking about stuff like this, where in the corner we want to be making sure we're pulling that material away um, because we don't want water being trapped on that on those panels. One other thing that you saw in, in here where they're highlighting is the seam sealer on the inner panel of the door. And I have this here as a reference. It's not the exact door, but a lot of doors have a seam, welded seam, right through here, this portion of the door. Right? There's a, there's a higher strength structural component to the front half of the shell versus the back half of the shell. And it's important, and Toyota's highlighted this, and there's a reason why. In the newer model cars that are coming out, um, airbag systems are becoming pressure sensitive. If we don't have seam sealer on these things, air is allowed to travel through that welded seam, potentially affecting these airbag systems. And we just want to make sure that, you know, we're, again, following all these procedures. They're telling us where the seam sealer needs to be applied. we got to make so, sure we're doing so it. So going back, Toyota is saying you should only be seam seal over a 2K epoxy primer, correct? Correct, yeah, and that's, again, highlighted in Crib 186 is that all seam sealers need to be prepared over properly primed surfaces, but two bullets before that, they're saying only a two-component epoxy or direct-to-metal, a two-component direct-to-metal primer, and so that we know there's some hybrids out there in the marketplace, but most urethanes require an etch primer, which they're saying right here, etch primer cannot exhibit, you know, those corrosion prevention. So we were in a big Lexus shop, and none of them knew that, right? Yes, it was, <laughs> it was early last year we went into a shop and they wanted to argue us and the owner actually had this bulletin. You came out of the bathroom was posted and he had, his the phone, you had your phone out and you're all excited. You're like, hey, check out what I saw in the bathroom. And I was like, God, ding, no way. But uh, I had to go in and see it for myself because I wouldn't look at your phone. But he had these posted above every urinal and he had both sides and he had it all highlighted and laminated. 
and it was inside the back of every stall door. But yet, when we were there talking to the technicians, every single one of them said, "Yeah, we don't follow that." Procedure. They were using bare metal seats. Yeah, yeah you, you, you've got a, a very large operation, but it's not just Toyota. And, and, and Toyota is a, a kind of an easy one. I've always called it out. I'm very passionate because I came from a Lexus repair facility. Um, so I'm very familiar with this, but Honda and Acura, I mean, early this year, they came out with a position statement similar, saying epoxy primer on, on all bare metal surfaces under all products, body fillers, refinished products, so rocker coatings, undercoatings. Um, GM, you know, they've got statements on how wide, how high the seam sealer bead should be. So when you're looking around this door panel here, how wide? 10 millimeters wide, 2 millimeters thick. I mean, it's this is the, the and stuff. that's to seal correctly when they close the door, right? And that's to seal correctly to, to close the door. And then they go in, you know, so Ford even has one where they'll tell you, you know, come up seven inches on the bottom. Don't just peel off the corner. Actually go up further on the panel so you have gasket clearance, right? And so we talk about all this like, yeah, okay, you say put it over a 2K primer. But, Sean, we all know that working on a car in the stall and then driving it up to the paint shop to prime it and then coming back to your stall is very ineffective. And so guys will commonly say, well, I want to use a 2K you know, primer, but it's very inefficient. So a simple way of doing that is mixing up primer, using a cotton dauber to actually apply it to the seam. And we're short on time. So and there's right, nothing wrong with doing that. A lot of no, guys there's not. In, in, in fact, where the mistake comes in, and the, and the important part is we always re, you know, recommend scuffing, cleaning, and drying the surface prior to. And this is why. So this panel here, dry to the touch. Nothing coming off on my fingers, right? I applied this actually about, well, about an hour ago. Now, if I come in here and scuff this, it's actually pulling material. Tom, you can kind of see a little bit on my glove there. It's rolling the primer in that joint. You can see how rough this is. It's actually rolling back here on this seam. And this is why we say scuff it, because now we know we've assured, you can, you can, almost, you can almost hear it grabbing um, on that primer. So we know that this has been fully cured. It's a spot check to it's make sure, spot check your, to make sure, primer sure that your primers, because we right. we're in a hurry. Right. right. We get paid on commission, we get paid on cycle time, and, and time is money, and we don't want to slow down for any of these products. So that's where we see, when we talk about all this primer stuff, this is really where the, the, the caution needs to come in. Um, and making sure that we're, you know, this thing here, I mean, what did that take me? All of yeah. a few seconds to determine that, hey, the primer's still not fully cured. Yeah. I better not put anything over it, including the rest of the paint line, you know, if I wasn't putting a seam sealer on there because you're going to have solvent trapped underneath of that. Yep. And, you know, one of the other areas that's more, you know, most important when we're using bare metal seam sealers and, and is, the, you know, the wheel arch area particularly. And when we're painting, you know, painters generally, they're going to be painting from this direction here in this wheel arch. And what happens is you get good coverage in here, but this backside edge on the inside, let me just turn this thing around, the inside edge here, they don't necessarily get because they don't have access to get the paint gun in here inside the wheelhouse, right? It's very tight. This is where you can come in here prior to applying your seam sealer with a cotton dauber, and you're going to be able to brush in your 2K epoxy primer. Again, going back to some of these panels and these examples, this one was made by Bill, apparently. <laughs> um, you know, sorry, Bill, if you didn't get your panel, I forgot to mail it to you. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if we used a 1K primer, this is what it would look like. But here's the 2K primer. So now if I've got that in here and I'm using, you know, seam sealer appropriately, you know, I know I'm, I'm not going to run the risk of having, co you know, corrosion build up in there. And if I'm using the appropriate 2K primer, I, I know I'm not going to run the risk of, you know, adhesion issues between the, you know, seam sealer and the, uh, the one component. Because realistically, you know, this could be resolubilized with a little bit of lacquer thinner. It's a lacquer-based product with no corrosion inhibitors in it. Um, it can, you know, present sort of a problem, you know, so, in your so repair. So we were talking, too, where we see if guys, um, if the OEM calls for bonding the wheel arch, and they bond that and get squeeze out with the adhesive, they go and they grind, they wait till it's cured and grind that back edge with a roll lock, and now you've got that very back edge there exposed, and that's what you're talking about, that, that same area. We just had a sample sent in the other day, and you can tell that's what they did, and it started to corrode and bleed oh, its it way was, in. There was almost nothing left of that inside edge, and yep. then it had rolled all the way. And, of course, customers never bring their car back, you know, right away when they see a problem. We yep. live very busy lives. They're waiting, you know, a month, two months, three months, and now all of a sudden it may have been a quarter replacement. Heck, it could have been just a dent, you know, in that box side where they had to do something. But... Now we're replacing the inners, the outers, right. the, you know, the other adjacent panels, which make it. Okay. So you're gonna you're gonna show us 
with the bare metal seam sealers, we're not saying that they're not good. It's all about paint coverage, right? It's That's about really paint coverage, yes. And so making sure that, you know, if we're using bare metal seam sealers, we want to make sure that we're getting good paint coverage. Going back to what I was referencing here in this wheel arch, you know, a lot of times, we'll, you know, they'll come back and they look great, right? And you can see we've got a few different profiles of, of beads going on here. And it's like, yeah, that looks really good. You know, this wheel arch here where, where we referenced, but if you really bent over and looked at it, you know, if, if, if this was like, you know, on a fender, Chevy truck on a fender, they've got seam sealer inside, you know, that, that jam. Lexus SUVs, a lot of them with the rolled over hem flanges now, that seems to is actually hidden on the back side. Yep. Um, if this is bare metal along here, you really run the risk of having corrosion that's going to start and build along that panel. And that corrosion is going to work its way underneath. The seam sealer is going to work its way under the adhesive. It's going to you know, cause that bond to fail and realistically leading to more catastrophic problems. That so we with that wheelhouse, with. the only way you could get full paint coverage is having the wheel off and spraying basically from the inside out. And if you can't spray, again, going back to using a cotton dauber, making sure going back you know, all the way to the beginning, let's make sure we're getting the appropriate material on first, that being the epoxy primer, because I've even seen guys that'll grind that edge off, they'll come in here and they might undercoat this with a bare metal undercoating and think that they still have corrosion, but they don't have anything right on, on this edge. edge. Yeah. And that's where the concern starts because this is where the, you know we can't necessarily get paint coverage, even with the wheel off. Sometimes it's, it's the cup hitting it. And even if you went to a mini cup, you, know, you might not be able to get access in here to really get good coverage on that backside edge. Mm -hmm. And so that's really some of the, you know, the, the major concerns that, that we see. And one of the ways, you know, the other things that some of the OEMs highlight, and I, I come back to FCA, they've got a great, you know, pre refinished guidelines, um, replicate the original look and appearance, right? And that becomes a very common thing, a, a common question that we get asked a lot. And so when they come into St. Paul, they usually start with a blade panel like this, um, and then they work through an exercise. Troy, apparently you didn't get your panel, so uh, <laughs> Troy, here's your panel. Christmas Make, present. Christmas present. We'll we'll mail it back to you here, but but yeah. So basically, they build these panels. We walk them through an exercise, and they get them get them familiar with using our product, using some different you know replication techniques and some procedures um, to really pro, you know restore the vehicle to its pre-accident crash worthiness. You know, part of that includes the appearance as well. Um, you know, getting into reinspections and kind of all of that. So, but looking at your tall, those really tall beads there, those are real potential for not getting coverage out along that edge, right? And that's exactly like this example here, where you know you really got to make sure that you're getting the proper mill build of the of the paint. You know, yeah. whatever you're using. If you're using thickens, if you're using BASF, if you're using Exalta, you know, just just dusting on enough so that you don't see any shiny metal really isn't an appropriate application. You need to make sure that you're following using the right tip size, you know, on your paint gun, um, making sure you're right, applying the right amount of coats, you're using the right sealers with the right base coats and the right clear coats um, to avoid any, you know, catastrophes further down the line. And, you know, one of the ways we kind of transition over, um, again, to what I consider to be sort of the final process or the final step of the full corrosion protection process, cavity wax. Something that, you know, you're, I know you're very passionate about. I am Kristen. I know you're very passionate about this as well. Cavity wax, in my opinion, you can do all this great work and follow all these procedures, but if you miss this part, you know, you, you've got a big problem. And one of the things I want to highlight here, you know, we talk about how do we protect these panels. We commonly hear, I know you, you've heard it for a long time, and, and when I, we're, we were out in the field, we hear it. I, I like to use a cavity wax when it's runny and it runs all over the place because then I know I've got enough in my frame rail. I've got enough in my door. You know, if it's running out the weep holes, I know I've got enough in there. So one of the things I want to do here to, as a, just an example, I'm going to start with our, and I shook these cans well before we started, so I'm not going to spend three minutes, you know, shaking this with that rattle going in your ear. But when we use our cavity wax, we want to apply three coats. And part of our DFU is you're going to usually apply two coats, you're going to give it a five to ten minute flash, and you're going to come back in with the third coat. Really, you want to apply this material during the reassembly process. So as you get the car back from paint, you know, you hang the door on there, you get it fitted up, I'm going to apply the cavity wax in there, and then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to finish assembling the rest of that door, allowing that cavity wax to work. Um, if you're using a cavity wax because you like the way it runs, and this particular brand, 
Um, the directions on it say one heavy coat, so let's give it one heavy coat. All right, so now that's the inside of my repair, and they said one heavy coat was appropriate. Now I want to go over to what Subaru says here. They've got four pages on cavity wax, and one of the procedures that I, I want to kind of highlight here is inside the door panels, you know, they're telling you, you know, two inches up from the bottom of that hem flange, we need to have at least two mils of material on that surface at any given time to, you know, prevent corrosion. Right, so if I'm putting in a cavity wax in there, and this goes all the way up the dog leg, all the way to the belt molding, you know, so if I'm putting cavity wax in there, how do I know it's going to be protecting it for the life of the vehicle? You know, how do I know it's going to stay where I put it? You know, if you want to go back to our, our pan, our examples here, you know, you can see sort of what's taking place here. I've got all my cavity waxes run out, but what's really left up here at the top of that repair? What is, what is still protecting, you know, maybe this is a weld zone. Right, and I've got bare metal up here. This is a brand new replacement panel. We've still got cavity wax over here, and about 20 minutes ago, I dropped this in, um, and this is showing the capillary action, meaning the wicking action. So in 20 minutes, Tom, if you want to zoom in here, I'm going to lift this out. You can see inside here, and this is in between the two panels, you can see where the cavity wax is already wicked vertically up inside there to protect these areas, right? So now we've got a cavity wax that staying where we put it, right, and it, it, it has a foamingness as part of the design, so it touches all those vertical surfaces. That's going to subside, you know, as that wicking takes place, and there is actually a runny, you know, element to it as it starts to subside where you're going to get that residue that's going to flow out down into that seam. What we want first is this action to kick in, right. be extreme, and then it's going to be followed by, in a few minutes, you'll start seeing this will start dripping a little bit, and you'll get that run action in there. So if, if you did that at your own shop in a water bottle, hang on to that bottle in a few minutes, you'll have a little bit of puddle down in the bottom. Yep, and that's you can where rotate the, it. The thin stuff separates out to wick in. And that's where you're getting it down in the lower portions of your frame rail, right? So you, you want it to be held where it, where it needs to be so it can wick up into these weld zones, but then, you know, coming out the bottom and protecting those other areas, which are extremely important. Um, you know, areas like this, you had mentioned when you were talking about your welding here where we've removed those coatings from the backside. Yep. The importance of knowing that, you know, the, look at the heat effect zone here and how it stayed within that paint. There's no burnt paint in here. I've got bare metal and I can't get access in there with primer. So now what I'm doing is I'm coming in with a cavity wax. That could be my rocker panel, my sail panel, any section joint. And that's what's going to protect that bare metal because when I put it in there, it's going to stay where I put it. It's going to wick and have a capillary action. Right, and then as it subsides, as that foaming that subsides and that wicking kicks in, there's going to be a little bit of flow to get to those lower portions. If it all ran to the lower portions right away, like this example here, then there would be nothing up here to protect these wells. And that's what Subaru is saying here is, you know, using a good cavity wax, right, something that's thick and sticky, but yet runny at the same time, which seems to contradict itself, but it makes perfect sense when you kind of see this example. And, and they're not the only ones. Nissan has this same thing, as you know, and, and other OEMs that, that reference this stuff. Um, it's very important. And then just knowing that externally, you know, it's, cavity wax is meant to be used internally. <laughs> we get this question a lot. Can I spray it on the outside of my repair? I've actually seen it where guys will get done, they'll do a great job, and then they'll take cavity wax and they'll spray the whole outer wheelhouse. It'll look like a roofing shingle with all the sand stuck to it. The later sand on, and right? the road debris and everything will <laughs> stuck to it. That's where the you know the undercoatings come in, the Pamble undercoatings and other you know exterior uh, products that are made for that. And I think that's what GM says they want a sticky material that doesn't get hard inside and something that dries to the touch on the outside. And they even go so far. I mean, when you start talking about mill build, I mean they're looking for 20 mils of build on on a lot of wheelhouses that don't have it from the factory. Yeah. But because we've been in there and we worked on it again, and, and this is kind of like, you know, we talked about at the beginning, Sean, how we really relate our training program here to the OEM repair procedures, walking through some of these examples and these processes, because I know as a tech, this was something I was always hungry for. I, I, I had a, you know, a, a desire for more education, more knowledge, more information, um, because I knew it was gonna lead to me making better repairs. Um, but as we're finding out, all this documentation, I know, Larry, you've, you've done some videos where you've got the, the stack of papers up about this high. I think, Sean, between you and my office, there's a hardly, <laughs> we look like hoarders <laughs> with all the OEM position statements and documents. 
And speaking of that, so, um, and we talked about the 1K versus 2K primer. So explain what we do with the training prop after they're done with it. Yep. So I don't after, remember if you said that or not. But so, yeah, after they're done there, with the prop, so we've got these SOPs hanging here in the room, and they're great because we walk the technicians through these exercises, and it's all laid out. And one of the things that we do with the 1K, 2Ks is, you know, we prime one side at, uh, the night, you know, they come in, they, they prep the panel, they weld it together, we prime one side for them with the 2K primer. The next day they come in and they choose which one, you know, 1K to be applied. And we give them like 16 or 17 different options, we just lay them all out on the table and they build it, they put the seam sealer on it, we put it through the tank and we send it back to them. And that's going back to, again, the, the, the advantage of the program that we have here is all these props are take home pieces. How long do those stay in the tank? So 500 hours is, is part, it's an ASTM B117, it's a salt fog chamber. Um, so 500 hours, 21 days is the minimum uh, requirement to be corrosion resistant. And, and as you've seen, I mean, you've seen how many, my bench is full of them every week. I just yep. keep running panels, running panels. Um, we haven't had any one component products that have actually made it through there. Yep. Now, we, there are some two component products that come in an aerosol that yep. have done very well. Yep. Um, but that's different. That's a 2K product. Exactly. It's not to be confused with the one component. And and I'm not only unimpressed with the 1K stuff, but wow, am I impressed with that epoxy primer? It's amazing. Well, when you're, they come out of that same $500 salt spray tank without a lick of rust on them, they're just when you look at clean. some of these panels. Now I feel like I'm digging around on my <laughs> desk with all this paperwork. But when you look at some of these panels, Sean, so like this side by side, to me, this is the one of the most impactful ones that we do. When we lay it side by side, right. right? So they're in the tank at the same angle. They're they're on the same surface. They're on a substrate that was prepped by, you know, a technician that came in and not by us. There's no funny business going on here, um, you know. And we mail it back to them. And the other thing I like when you do your testing on those, you dip the edges in wax. Yeah. And and um, I just saw somebody, uh, another brand, showed some testing that they did, and you could see rust on there, but you could tell the rust it started on the unprotected edge. And then and moved down and ran onto the sample, and that eliminates that problem. And that's called corrosion creep, and there's actually an ASTM test for that. And yeah. so what they did was they basically contaminated one test with another by doing that. And so, yes, you're right. When you're doing a 117 test, you want to make sure that the edges are protected. Um, in this case here, we dip these in a wax after they're built, and then we put them in the chamber. So we have no corrosion creep coming in from any edge. It's purely the substrate right or right. purely the material itself and as a standalone product which is what's required to pass that test oh so now you're starting to get some of this creeping out of here now yep so there's the, there's the creep that we were talking about and so you see how long that was allowed to sit in that in that environment in that panel so that whole time this capillary action has been taking place wicking in between all those weld zones and now you're getting that creep and that's commonly what we hear is guys will say your product doesn't run like the other guys and it's like, it's not that it doesn't run. We just have a built-in delay to the system so that we don't have it all over the floor because the shop's not paying for this. Right, right. Right, they're getting paid for this. And if you're charging for that, I mean. And by the way, another thing I hear sometimes is, hey, you got to be careful that can stain the paint. Um, so cavity wax won't stain there's the paint. Some brands potentially that could do that. But right. yes, we our product has been tested on fresh paint. We don't have any staining. Um, or, or causes the, any concerns there whatsoever. It easily is wiped off with wax and grease remover um, or, you know, like a G-Pack cleaner or something like that. So especially in, important in the weep holes, right? When this actually starts before we deliver the car, we want to make sure we clean all those areas off so we don't have it dripping sure. off. Well, hey, I, th I think we're good here, right? Uh, yeah, I'm good. Um, Kristen, how are you good? We're yeah. out on time. Out on I time. I'm doing great. We've got time. You've got, um, I mean, actually, we could go all day, right? It's my show. <laughs> um, so, so I make the rules. Hey, if you don't mind, hey, Tom, bring that camera out a little wide. And, and can you step in there and say hi to everybody? I know you've been running the camera, but I do want everybody to see Tom. He looks like Kyle from South Park right uh, now. There he is. Hey, Tom. <laughs> hey, there he, hey, Tom, while I got you, you know, being painter, because painters rule. Um, any chance uh, that you guys can talk about that new little gun you picked up over there, Ryan? Are we allowed to talk about it yet? Absolutely. If you, no, you're talking about the Voltaire. The Voltaire. If the high performance spray gun. Lightest, lightest gun in the industry. 
It's really all about an improved spray pattern is what it's about, right? Yeah, the spray yeah and you guys, hey, Ryan or Sean, y'all may want to do some talking since Tom's not, I don't know if he's mic'd up oh, there. Oh, yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was going to let the painter do no, it. No, no, hey, Tom, tell him what he needs to say because Ryan can't paint. <laughs> we're we're, we're going to get this to the body guy here. So we have, we have an improved collar design that's actually a quarter turn lock on it now. So we don't have the tabs any longer. Um, so we're getting a good positive lock once it's in place, so the, the tips aren't gonna be able to you know, be pulled off or fall off. Um, the lightest technology in the industry, so it's very lightweight. Um, we also have one for industrial that actually uh, hooks up to pressure pot systems. Um, the biggest thing is transfer efficiency with that. Transfer gondola. efficiency, we've, the, the improved spray pattern, the, the atomization and the droplet size, we've actually added a 1.6 nozzle tip to the whole system now too. So I think we've got a 1.2, 1.3, 4, 6, 8, and a 2.0 as part of the entire system. And they're all color-coded, so you can't mix them up, which is very good. So lock and collar is big. Yep. You'll be my narrator. Yep. Lock, lock, and and collar, lock and collar is big. If you stand close enough to me, you can actually yeah, hear can me. Yeah, can you hear me now? I can, absolutely. Yeah, so the lock and collar is a big change. Um, versus the tabs on the side. So this is gonna be a lot easier. It's also a lot, it holds a lot, a lot more control, so a lot more sturdy. Um, like Ryan said, all the different tips that we have available with this, which is great. And I don't know if we mentioned it yet, but available in pressure too. So like a two-quarter pressure pot, we actually have a alternate version of the head that launched simultaneously with the gravity so we can attach to a pressure pot in all those same sizes too, which is pretty slick. A um, Couple more things on the heel of the gun. This is different from the standard AccuSpray. We actually beef this up so you don't need two tools to tighten. You can just grab one, uh, you know, a crescent wrench and tighten this down, the gauge, which is pretty slick. Body's different too, completely different material from the AccuSpray. So this is gonna be a solvent resistant and impact resistant. Oh, man, yeah. <laughs> um, and then just, yeah, like I said, the hook, which is great, fan pattern adjustments, the knobs are easier to grab and turn, uh, trigger, just everything. But biggest improvement, like these guys said, is just gonna be the spray performance of the gun, excellent atomization, big pattern, much, much faster. And so we're really, really high, happy with High the efficiency of this gun. delivery. Yeah, yeah uh, I know, you guys let me tell, I've had that thing high. for probably about, about the time we got ready to shut down for COVID. And, and I think your directions to me were try to break it and and I've slammed it and I've thrown it around the shop or whatever. I haven't broke it yet. So everybody's going well. Good. She finally did it. Do we have any questions? Um, I'm going to double check real quick. Most of it, most everything coming in, Sean was just people saying hi. I think everybody was glad to see you guys. Kind of like all of us. We haven't seen each other in so long. We all wanted to say hi and, and see each other. Um, and then a lot of comments just kind of reconfirming what uh, what you guys um, had said. So. Um, a lot of good tips there for body men to, and, and anybody, body maintainers, painters, shop owners, everybody to pay attention to. So um, my takeaway, um, I love the plunge test, Sean. I hadn't done that before, and I don't think I've seen that one from, from before. So that was, that's a great idea to make sure I don't cut through the, the next panel. When we did the Honda video at your place, uh, we did a, vi a short video on that as well. Yeah. Yeah, I would love to get that video in a format where I can actually release that. So um, yeah. I know we were we were testing and doing some work, but that's just a fantastic tip and, and something definitely. Um, yeah, we see a lot of guys trying to make that cut with like a mini saw, but if you have a if you have a reinforcement right behind it, you just can't do that. So it works really really good. You just weld that cut back up. Nobody will ever see yeah. it. On the, once on you put the, the gasket the, on there, you don't see that cut inner structure. <laughs> <laughs> Sean, on the uh, on the Volkswagen and Audis, a lot of the steel vehicles, we're trained when we go to the classes that you can't scar that Martin site or 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 the you know um, heat treated um, you know boron alloy steel uh, reinforcement yep. in there, and it almost sits maybe like two three millimeters tops from the back side of the outer rocker panel, so. We're trained that we have to either, you know, very carefully cut a hole to see where the axis is like you did with the plunge. And then no matter what we do, they want us to shove metal pieces in there to get in behind there so that we don't cut that. Because if we cut it, their rule is you have to change the part, which now you go right. from a little small section into procedure to cutting the whole entire rocker off and the B pillar overlaps 
the rocker. So it, they, they're really very strict with us when they do the training to make sure. And this plunge thing is probably a little yep. bit of an easier way to get back there and see what's in there. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up because normally I do slide like a little I-car uh, plate um, between those panels when I make the final grind, grind right up. I don't want to grind right down against that inner, so I slip a little a little piece of sheet metal in between there, and then for sure you won't touch anything. So yeah, slow point. and steady does win the race on some of those uh, components like that because, <laughs> like you said before, you can't go ahead and just weld it up and yeah. say, okay, it's okay, yeah. no one's going to see it. I don't know. I just got to get yeah. it done. Gotta get it <laughs> gotta done. Get it done. <laughs> We're almost to Friday. I got to get that car to paint. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, I appreciate it so much. This has been this has been really good. We just got to beam into where you guys were. I wish we could have got it approved to have y'all drive down. Um, I think we're going to do this again. So next time for the next World Fair, yeah. um, I, hopefully we will see you guys in this office. Um, and if anybody out there, I know everybody was just kind of waving and saying hi, but if you have questions, these two guys are easy to reach. Um, you can reach them. A lot of times you'll find them on social media. Yes. Um, inside uh, some of the groups commenting and helping us out as we go along. You can also reach out to them and reach out on the 3M. Um, if you guys wouldn't mind, can you mention a little bit about the Academy and what's on there kind of as a closeout? Sure. You want to do that? Yeah. So, uh, you know, if you go on the, collision, the 3M Collision Repair Academy, um, all of our products and all of our portfolios, we've got great uh knowledge, training, videos, applications available. And it's actually a great tool, especially for shops that are onboarding employees. Uh, it gives a shop an opportunity to make sure that you're kind of level setting each employee as they come in. So by making that, you know, kind of a requirement of the shop is really what we originally were designing it for on top of training was the opportunity for shops to say, hey, you complete all these courses. And then I know at least you have this level set of knowledge of not just the processes, um, but if, especially for, you know, shop using 3M products, you know, they, they understand the product and the applications of the product. Um, and then they understand that, you know, through those courses, you're able to reach out to, to guys like Sean and myself. And yeah. uh, maybe when I come back to social media, I'll, I'll start answering some questions in those groups. I would right say now, I don't, leave it up to you. don't come back too soon, Ryan. It's still kind of a mess in there. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, so, so one last thing on the Academy, by the way, is we designed those courses to be like really basic 101 for some people, but if you're more advanced, we have more advanced information. So like, for example, we have a glossary and you know, it might sound really simple a glossary of terms, but there's a lot of terms that, that maybe some guys haven't even seen yet. And I mean, it explains the difference between MIG and MAG and things like that. But um, so you can, you can do that if you're entry level, but then we also have um, some really good courses like on rivet bonding, where we actually did a video where we replaced a rear cab panel on an F aluminum F-150, um, which is a really good video. So, um, you know, kind of tried to tailor it so it didn't matter if you were entry level or a little more experienced where you're going to get something out of those, those videos and those trainings. Yeah, absolutely. It is a great resource for the industry, and it's one of those things that I point um, a lot of new adjusters to even. I think it's great training for them to go in there and watch. So we're glad that you guys have it. Well, hopefully we're you adding guys... to it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Well, hopefully you are snowless there in Minnesota so far, and we hope that you guys have a fantastic holiday. But next time, we want you here in Little Rock with us so we can have some real fun. And uh, I just will say, Ryan, I, that's the first time I've seen you do that cavity wax demo. It's my new favorite. I'm going to steal it. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm just going to be honest. I'm going to call it like this. I'm going to be honest. So All awesome, right, guys. I love it. Have a fantastic day, and we hope to see you all soon. Thanks. Thanks. Right. Can't Thanks. wait to come back down there. See you later. See you, uh, Larry. Bye well, guys, bye. thanks for joining us on the World Fair. The, what does the OEM require here with 3M? And sticking with us, so, hey, we had to do the whole, you know, beam them in, beam Scotty in, yeah. kind of thing. I think it worked out okay. Um, but Looked definitely good. a great show. We will see you back here tomorrow morning. Um, some of my favorite people on the planet are here. Tim and Ginger Briggs from Collision Edge will be joining us. Um, the, the, this guy just thinks up cool products in his sleep. So we're going to be going over Collision Edge in the morning. Yep. And then we're going to do a wrap-up show. We're just going to have a good time tomorrow, really. Uh, we're going to all get together. A lot of people are going to be beaming back in with us on Zoom as we're here live in the studio and just kind of take of our biggest takeaways from the week, things we've learned. Some questions had came up from the first week show, and we're going to get right. you the answers to them on that. That'll be great.